Hello guys, it's me in audio form today because today I am talking about 10 games that uh, should have uh, Switch physicals in some capacity, but do not. And again, uh, keep in mind, uh, I'm not playing the games that you are seeing right now. If you are seeing games live, maybe I put up a picture preliminary-wise to make up for the fact that I'm not talking about a game yet. Who knows? So yes, we're talking about games in a sort of game sack style review. You know, that's one of my favorite channels, Game Sack. So without further ado, let's talk about the first game. That being Asta Breed, or is it Asti Breed, or Aced Breed, or... I'm just fucking with you, I'm pretty sure it's Asta Breed. Anyway, so the game itself is, uh... It's sort of a mech style, uh, fluid motion, different perspective sort of shoot 'em up. A very unique shoot 'em up in a J indie game, uh, one that was originally released on PC ages ago and was ported to Switch. I've heard the Switch port is kind of a downgrade. I don't exactly care too much. It plays okay to me. You know, uh, if I wanted the PC version, I'd buy the PC version, but it was on sale for super cheap, so I thought might as well. Now, I'm kind of surprised it doesn't already have a Switch physical. I mean, it does have a ps4 physical through limited run um it's a game with a lot of sort of controls for a shoot 'em up it's definitely more leaning towards the mech perspective as opposed to a standard shoot 'em up where you just shoot and bomb and that's about it and the actual uh story kind of skipped it it looks all right the story looks decent believe it or not as you can see from the gameplay that i'm showing i'm playing a later stage and that's something you'll notice throughout many sessions of gameplay that i'm doing is that i'm kind of just starting wherever i happen to be from my save which is not a game sack thing to do i know but i'm doing it my own way i've done reviews in the past way back when they were kind of shit I, I would basically do this sort of thing when it comes to my like awesome mini games from steam series which i did revive at some point so consider this sort of a spiritual successor but on switch yeah um you'll notice in this gameplay i tend to slash and use my melee a lot more than my actual shooting it's just really satisfying to use those little red ships that you see throughout the gameplay i tend to ignore them those little red UFOs because I'm not very good at getting them all. I, I, trust me, I try, but I'm mainly good at getting those smaller enemies. But overall, I would say this game is a little bit dull when it comes to the color palette, although it is flashy. I mean, there's a lot of grays and blues and not a whole lot of variety. But keep in mind, this is an, an indeed a small team that developed the game, and uh, it's certainly going for an, an aesthetic. It's not just being lazy like some early PS3 games that look similar or trying to go for the quote-unquote realism because it's definitely not you can tell by all the fucking effects and whatnot but uh what that amounts to when it comes to actual fidelity on switch i'm looking at the footage and really it's hard to tell what exactly makes it all that different from the pc port really uh it's certainly something that i think holds up pretty well it's not graphically amazing but most shoot em ups on switch usually are not if they were they probably wouldn't run very well due to just the amount of sheer bullets on screen bullets and missiles and one on enemies but i think this manages a good balance i, I think they use pre-rendered uh videos in the background i'm pretty sure to get around that if i were to hazard a guess so yeah i made it to the final boss in this recording actually scratch that it was not the final boss it was a fake out final boss which uh, I know these games typically love to do. And in the beginning, they also had to fake out like typical JRPG bullshit where it's like you have to lose in order to progress. Basically faking out the player and thinking, oh, you know, I can win this when in reality you can't. It's super annoying. Thankfully though, it wasn't too bad. I I've seen way worse examples like Final Fantasy games especially are super bad about that. Anyway, let's move on to the next game. Keep in mind, this is in no particular order of when I recorded these or alphabetically or anything like that. It's a game of which I've shown on my channel before. It's an independently funded game in the style of Shantae, and uh, it's definitely that sort of Metroidvania vibe, but with that sort of low budget indie feel. It was originally released on the Dreamcast, believe it or not. It's Intrepid Izzy, I should say the title already. It's Intrepid Izzy, it's got sort of that kind of early 2010 internet humor which i have a soft spot for because that's when i was really growing up and was watching the internet mostly it was the late 2000s and early 2010s you'll notice throughout the gameplay that i have some gameplay from when i beat the game 100 percent on my save file whereas some of the gameplay is from another save that i decided to start to capture the beginning portion of the game the game itself is not 
too crazy hard. I will say this much, the amount of backtracking and going back and forth is kind of annoying. I mean, at some point in the game, you get a mirror that can transport you to any point you want to go. You also uh, have to change wardrobes to uh, do certain tasks in the game that requires you to go back to your house every time, which is kind of annoying. Whereas the game that's inspired by, or the game series that it's inspired by, Shantae, all you really have to do is just press a button and do a dance and you can change into various transformations. There's a good amount of variety to the game. Uh, you'll see in this gameplay session I played a minecart section. There's also mini games you can play at the arcade in the game and I uh, managed to get the high score on one of them during my new session. I already got all the high scores in my old session but there's not really much to do once you actually do it. The guy just says good job. There's no, there's no real incentive to do it besides just completing the game which I don't even know if that really counts or your 100% or not. Well, I did say the game had variety. The They do reuse the boss that I do show in the beginning of the game. They use that boss like three times, making them slightly harder, but that's the only reused boss. Other than that, the boss fights are usually pretty unique and pretty challenging, which with each different solutions, although a little bit formulaic, but not too big of a deal. There is, however, a lot of challenge rooms, which do require you to defeat the same amount of enemies over and over again. Even if you've already retread the same place, they require you to do it. It's kind of annoying. That's a minor nitpick in an otherwise great game, which I think does indeed deserve a physical, besides the Dreamcast part. Last time I made a Let's Play about games that deserve physicals, I kind of went over games that, looking back, probably do not deserve a physical. This next one, I'm actually surprised it never had a physical, which is part of the reason why some of these games I'm about to show, I didn't show in the last video, despite already owning, because I just didn't do a simple Google search, is all. Anyway, I'm talking about Epistory Typing Chronicles. Now, part of the reason why I think this game never had a physical is because, at least on Switch, it's published by Cubic Games with a Q, Q-U-B-I-C games. And none of their games, I don't really think, ever have had physicals. They're not much of a company that typically lets games have physicals. I don't know how that works, maybe I'm wrong, but I just tend to notice that their stuff tends to be stuff that's usually digital only. This game is a little bit unique on Switch because you actually get to plug in a keyboard, any keyboard you want, and use it to control the game as well as type in the game. It's a typing adventure. It's, it's one of the few typing games on Switch or on any platform really ever. There's not a whole lot of typing games besides like Mavis Beacon and shit. And to me it's like a full-fledged like actual release. It's not one of those like shovelware shit that you see on Switch all the time. It's actually something that has a beginning, middle, and end, has a whole story to tell, has great graphics for the art style it's going for with the sort of paper, sort of crafty aesthetic. It's got good soundtrack. It's got, you know, the typing works, you know, there's not there's not many too obtuse words or anything like that overall. It's a great game. Now, I've actually gotten farther in this game on PC than I have in the Switch port. I think I've almost beaten the game on PC. I've never actually beaten the game flat out. But yeah, I'm going through the water world you see throughout this video, but but it's a pretty lengthy adventure and I'm only showing like a small snippet of the actual game and I don't think it has replay value but obviously I have replayed it so maybe it does I don't know I will say one last thing being that uh, the game doesn't have too much decentivization when it comes to dying you can die pretty much anytime you want and it'll get put back to a reasonable checkpoint so it's definitely a very easy game meant for babbies if you will the way the story is told is definitely in the style of a storybook does that make me a loser for playing it fuck if I now. Hey, how about you just go fuck- Next game! Speaking of games that I'm surprised don't have physicals, it's a game that is not a foregone conclusion. It's foregone! Apologies for the dad joke. Yes, foregone. Um, believe it or not, I initially thought this was made by the same team that made Dead Cells. It looks very similar. Structurally, it is basically a clone of Dead Cells, but instead of a weird flame guy, you basically got a girl boss sort of pixie-haired little... Actually, let's just keep it at that. She's a girl girl boss. Yeah, it, it's fun. It's certainly not as good as Dead Cells, but Dead Cells already has a physical. In fact, it has more than one physical, and that's just on Switch, let alone all the other platforms. It's got a little bit of different mechanics. It's definitely got that sort of uh, Diablo-style looting and grabbing stuff and upgrading stuff, and it definitely borrows from that sort of genre a little bit. It's easier than Dead Cells, I'll say that much. I mean, it's certainly not anywhere near as punishing 
punishing as Dead Cells is. I guess I just really like that kind of game because I just want more of it. I just want another physical that resembles that style of game. What can I say? The game is pretty engrossing. I mean, I did record way more footage for the game than I ever intended to. I mean, in all honesty, if you're going to copy something, copy something that's pretty freaking good, which Dead Cells is, and so is Foregone because of it. Y'all like mech games? I certainly do. That's why I'm including Assault Gunners HD Edition. This is published by Marvelous. Marvelous. It was originally a mobile game, although you wouldn't really be able to tell just by looking at it, in my humble opinion, which is the only opinion that matters. So, suck it. I mean, it's your typical mech affair. I mean, you have your units, which you can command. You have your uh, shoulder weapon, as well as your main weapon and sub weapon, if that's possible, plus a fist. The graphics are super muddy and dark, as you can see by my gameplay footage. It's definitely something that's not going to visually impress you. I kept wanting to jump throughout the game, but I'm pretty sure you can't. I think you can glide upward. I did accidentally once while playing. Can't replicate it, so who knows? The controls aren't all that complicated, but I'm sure it's some sort of bullshit that I don't know about. That requires reading, which I am too lazy to do in this part of my life. Speaking of that, I'm pretty sure this game is a story with some anime people or something. I don't really care. There isn't that much content throughout the game, but I can imagine this being sort of a low budget sort of release physically, if you will, maybe for 30 or 40 bucks. Ideally, I'd like this to be 20 bucks, but I can't see them selling a physical for that much in the year 2023 anymore. Am I just stupid because I keep getting parts and whatnot and like ways to upgrade, but I still don't know how to do any of that. The game is not too hard, even on the hardest difficulty it's not too hard, but it does scale up eventually where it does get pretty hard. Uh, yeah, you can also turn on friendly fire during inferno mode, which is like the uh, survival mode, which I don't even know why the hell you'd want to turn on friendly fire anyway. You can see in a certain part of the gameplay where eventually I play the DLC mission that I bought in inferno mode, and certainly it was meant for when you upgrade completely, because the second wave I got completely destroyed. That's all I have to say about that. That's my Forrest Gump impression. Do you like it? Next up is a game published by, believe it or not, Sony on Nintendo. And this isn't the first game to be published by uh, Sony on a Nintendo platform. Believe it or not, it goes all the way back to the SNES days, before the PlayStation even came out. And it's published by the same group, the Sony Music Group, that published the uh, initial SNES games. And it's Necrosphere. The game we're talking about is indeed Necrosphere. Now, you're not going to believe this, but this game did get a physical for, believe it or not, Sony platforms. A Sony published game getting a Sony physical? How crazy, it was through Strictly Limited, it was for PS4 and PS Vita. Now I will admit the controls in these games do kind of piss me off, because you can't use the analog sticks and you can only use one part of the D-pad, that being the left D-pad button, and you have to use something like L and R or like ZR and ZL in order to control the game because it's only like a two button game essentially. Like you can't jump, you can't really attack, later on there's like a mechanic in the game where you can like skip and you have to like press one of the buttons like twice and it'll do it. Although it's really finicky and it doesn't work all the time. And, and you'll notice in this playthrough, I spent a lot of times on certain levels because it's brutally hard. I think in like my close to 30 minute recording session, I only beat like three sections. Maybe it was four and just two of them were close together. I don't know. Either way, you're going to see a lot of me dying as I'm talking or you pretty much already have seen that. The music in the game is pretty good, but that's what I expect from a Sony music published game. Honestly, the graphics are kind of lazy. I think they're too simplistic, and I think the game could actually do without the pixel art style. So many games rely on it, but I don't think it needs it. I think it's good at slowly rolling out mechanics for the game. I mean, it's really satisfying once you get that sort of aha moment of what you're supposed to do, and then you actually have to execute it, which is the hardest part of the game. Maybe it'll reveal itself later on, but why is it called Necrosphere? I mean, it's not like the game has much of a plot anyway to begin with. You know, on second thought, I just thought about it. There's a little bit of visual trickery in the sort of pixel art that makes it slightly less lazy, but I still think it's too simplistic. You'll notice that with the green ooze in this, uh, section of gameplay that I recorded. We're in the second level and it's kind of cool, I guess, the sort of animation it plays. Oh, how could I forget? There's like a collectible in the game. You can collect certain, like, I think they're tracks, like they're cassette tapes or something, or maybe they're CDs or vinyls or something. I don't exactly remember. The game is music themed and basically you collect them by doing little out of your way challenges within the levels. By the way, the game is published by Sony Music Entertainment, which is what the Sony Music Publishing thing was called that I couldn't think of earlier. 
on SNES were Jelly Boy 2, which was Japanese exclusive. It was Extra Innings, which is a baseball game, Equinox, and Skyblazer, which is kind of a fan favorite by many and a bit of a cult classic for the SNES. Next up is a game I've owned for a while. It used to be on just PC and PS4, but now is also on Switch under a different name. Previously known as Earth's Dawn, now it's known as Earth Wars. It's a sort of hack and slash looter, if you will, a shooter looter. It's super low budget, super low effort animation, very low res, and definitely inspired by Vanillaware, but like Vanillaware at home, if you will. The core gameplay is a bit grindy, but I do think it is fun. The enemy variety isn't the best. It does get better as the game goes along, but you definitely know that they did reuse a lot of assets in the game. To this day, I don't know how the ranking system works, really. I don't know what deserves an S rank, what deserves an E rank, D, so on and so forth. I do find it kind of annoying that as you level up, you can't really use all your abilities. You have to sort of pick and choose which ones you want due to how much allocation of whatever the hell the upgrade points are in the game. The game has a certain time limit system where it counts down to each and every mission, but you can usually just ignore it once it gets to zero and you've tried it once. The game does have a hard leveling system, like kind of like Fallout New Vegas, where again, certain enemies you cannot deal with until you're a certain level. Even while you're traveling with low level enemies, occasionally there'll be like a mega giga chat enemy that'll fuck you up if you don't be careful enough to avoid them. For some reason as well, when you uh, make certain custom weapons with like certain parts that have certain attributes some of them are negative and will fuck you up as you're actually like attacking people and some of them are positive and are super good usually I mix them up and the game is very much emphasized on making custom weapons and custom sort of attributes to those weapons as you go along and upgrading your gear and doing things how you want to do it finally I'll say this there's certain levels that are super easy certain levels are super hard but in general the level concepts are pretty repetitive usually not a lot of unique concepts per sort Sort of area. Oh yeah, and there's a story, but God knows I don't give a shit. Moving on. Next up is a game with no story whatsoever. It's easy come, easy go. Golf. Now please excuse my terrible gameplay as I am playing on a capture card as well as the docked mode already has a sense of delay to begin with. What can I say? It's a timing based game as most sports games are. This game on mobile is known as Clap Hands Golf. Now um, it's actually made by Clap Hands Limited which is a company that spun off from the original company that made the Hot Shots Golf series as it's known in America or as it's known all across the world. Everybody Buddy's golf. They've also made games like Hot Shots, Tennis, and whatnot, but their main focus tends to be golf. I will say this much, I do like the cartoony sort of budget Pixar style that the graphics tend to have. Although, I will say this much that uh, the courses are very, very similar. I oftentimes mistake them. You know, you can play them mirrored, you can play them with big holes, you can play them with vacuum holes, you can play them in uh, windy conditions, super stormy conditions, you can play them with rain, you can play it with clear skies and no wind. You can do either a traditional nine hole course or an 18 hole course, which is pretty competitive with the uh, off-screen people competing with you or you compete one-on-one -on -one with a version of yourself a specific character which there are a lot of characters you can unlock costumes or different color variations which if you manage to beat that CPU you actually unlock a further level which you can upgrade your uh, people by playing uh, more and more games and unlocking more and more stats when you're playing a traditional course there's usually some stat boosters which you can unlock on certain holes if you get a birdie or better and uh, these stat boosters on the time help characters level up a lot faster. You actually unlock characters by facing them in a boss battle. Usually the boss battle has some sort of gimmick and the CPUs on the boss battles can get super hard. Now sometimes these boss battles spawn randomly but usually the way to unlock a boss battle is, is to unlock points by completing the challenges. You know the traditional courses not the sort of uh, costume courses that uh by the way also sometimes have unique gimmicks like whoever shoots your shot the furthest or whoever um gets closest to the hole that sort of stuff. You know, there is two ways of playing. There's the way with the analog stick, which I never use because it's super confusing, or there's the traditional golf way of using meters, which is what I use. You can play on online ranked tourneys where people try to get the best score given a particular course of the week. In general, the game is good about tracking all your stats, like how far this you've done your first drive, how far this you've done your second drive, you know, that sort of stuff, and also uh, your records on each particular kind of course, except for the vacuum courses, it doesn't track that. 
A downside of this game is that it has insane load times, like probably some of the worst that I've encountered on Switch. God knows a cartridge version would be even worse. But guess what? This is a complete package, and I'm surprised it hasn't even gotten a physical at all. I mean, I know this was a mobile game, and that's probably why it also has touch controls, which I forgot to mention earlier. I never use the touch controls. It also has gyro, by the way, but it's only for like controlling the camera, which is basically useless. Gosh dang, I, I just keep forgetting stuff. Like for example, like uh, there's a timer that changes every day or every certain amount of plays that you play with the game that shuffles the things that you can do on each particular course. That's something I completely forgot about. So I'm gonna leave it at that because if I keep going, I'm gonna be here all day talking about all the crap that's in this game but it's not crap it's good stuff play it we're almost at the home stretch people we only got two more to go next up is spin frog all aboard the frog top this is from a studio that's kind of a ripoff studio. It's called Studio Somewhere. Their previous game was Benito Days, which is a monkey target from Super Monkey Ball ripoff. And uh, this one, Spin Frog, is a ripoff of Kuru 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 Rin from Nintendo, believe it or not, although never localized until the Wii U. Just saw a video on it, otherwise I wouldn't have known that. It's got that indie, low poly, pixely filter sort of pastel color style of something like. Like, uh, sock pop games almost. The in game playlist that plays has a great feature where it shuffles each time you play. Each song is pretty good. Same thing with Benito Days, but both of them have issues with compression. They seem to have that problem that certain flash animations from back in the day had, where I guess when it comes to processing the music in the game, they did something wrong. I've noticed other studios do this as well. It's got a story, it's probably some cutesy like, ooh woo, look at all the cute animals and their cute little friends, and sort of like CalArts bullshit Steven Universe story or some shit. I just realized like they're totally taking advantage of the whole frog game sort of trend that came out in the indie sphere about like last year or two years ago I would say. It's basically a carbon copy of Kuru 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 Rin. Uh, it has hats, which I guess is different, but there was some element of customization in Kuru 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 Rin on GBA. I don't know about the GameCube version, I've not played that, but uh, you can customize the color of your copter wings, as well as the pot that you sit in. How fun is that? I should probably explain how Kuru 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 Rin and Spin Frog play, because not everybody knows about this game. In fact, most people don't know about this game straight up. Either one. You control a ship in Kuru 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 Rin, but you control a frog copter and spin frog. And basically, you navigate a series of tight corridors and sort of maze like structure. And you have to control the spinning by either slowing it down or speeding it up, but you can't reverse. In Kuru 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 Rin, you can if you uh, hit a little uh, springboard, but not in this game, not yet. Maybe it will at some point, I don't know. But basically, you have to navigate some tight corridors, collect coins along the way, hopefully, not get hit you have three hearts to be able uh, to survive and basically you try to get to the end of the level it's kind of like irritating stick that classic format that's oftentimes used on Japanese game shows you get three sort of medals if you complete the level in a certain amount of time if you complete it without getting hit and if you collect all the coins now you can do these separately and these will all build up to the eventual star you will get for doing all three you don't have to do them all at the same time I learned that the hard way other than that the game's pretty straightforward not much else to say Anyway, let's move on to the final game of the video. Boy, is this one a doozy. It's one that still doesn't have a physical. It's Spelunky 2. Despite releasing on PlayStation 4 three years ago and releasing on Nintendo Switch two years ago, no physical in sight. The first game eventually did get a physical release years later on various platforms, but Spelunky 2, no dice. Splunky was originally a freeware game released in 2008 for PC. It has since been remade in 2012 for the Xbox 360 and ported various places. I've never been a huge fan of the original Splunky. I feel like games like Spirits Abyss vastly uh, overshadow it. Splunky's got some like dark soul sort of lore, you know, like the deep knowledge you have to find out through various flavor text. Don't really give a shit. Splunky 2 is more of the same. Uh, I decided to play as the uh, animal character for this playthrough. Although you can play as various characters and uh, you can unlock some, but God knows I will never do that because this game is brutal. Now I would argue it's not as brutal as its predecessors like La Mulana or Wreck Dangerous. God knows Wreck Dangerous is like the most bullshit game ever invented. 
It's kind of fun when you die. It's kind of fun watching the various silly ways that you get brutally pwned, dude. The music is all right, if extremely repetitive due to how many times you will fucking die. There's a lot of depth to the mechanics of the game. I mean, there's certain things that you learn as you go. Certain things are based on the original Spelunky, which I know very little about, so I kind of came in here with fresh eyes. The graphics are all right. I mean, they're very much vector-based like an old Flash game, but in a modern style. I mean, as somebody who's a fan of this kind of game, I would say it's probably the second best in the genre. I would still say Spirits of Abyss is probably the best one I've ever played. When is that game coming to Switch? I mean, Jesus. Consider this and pretty much all the ones I've done a more of a surface level review style like Game Sack. I think I mentioned that like once or twice. I'll just say this. The enemy variety, I'm assuming, gets better as you go along, but the enemy variety already is pretty good. The methods of attack are pretty limited, but you can get pretty creative with what you got. I mean, there's ways to earn more hearts, there's ways to gain things through the shop there's ways to i literally did a sacrifice in this game in this playthrough but what i will say is the weakest part of this game is easily the controls the controls are very loose and sort of uh floaty but not as bad as the original the original is what made me not like that game at all as the controls spirits abyss has a much more solid control scheme should I have bought this game on PC with all the cool mods and stuff you can do with it? Maybe it would have controlled better? I don't know. I got this because I had a gift card and uh, I wanted to use it on this game because it was on sale. I mean, I made it to a boss and I died immediately. So that makes me qualified to talk about all these games. Anyway, I'm going to leave it at that and uh, die of embarrassment. Bye!